Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Channel S. As usual, we bring a very special person, a distinguished person, to Channel S uh, on this program, Friends of Bangladeshi. Before we start our conversation, let's go and see a video clip. As a member of parliament for St. Albans, Anne Main has developed a reputation as a fierce advocate for her constituency and as a key campaigner on not only local issues, but also on a national and international scale. In 2009, Anne was elected chair of the British Bangladesh All-Party Parliamentary Group, a cross-party group of MPs and Lords who monitor events in Bangladesh and work to foster a greater understanding of the country and provide a channel for the UK Bangladeshi community with parliament. In the wake of the growing Rohingya crisis, Anne led a group to visit the refugee camps in Cox Bazar, taking account of the £3 billion contribution the curry industry makes towards the prosperity of Great Britain. She has called for further debate on the provision of skilled chefs in light of proposed immigration restrictions. She is also a president of the Conservative Friends of Bangladesh and strongly believes in ensuring that the community is accurately represented by a party that supports its values. We have just seen a documentary on the special guest today. And um, she is none other than Ann Main MP. Welcome to Channel S. Thank you very much. On Lovely Friends to be here. Bangladesh program. Ann Main is very popular within the community and very well known. Uh, she has significant contribution towards the community and the country. Welcome. Where did you study? I studied at Swansea University and um, after I graduated I went to Sheffield University to mm. do a postgraduate in teaching. Then soon after you got married, didn't you? That's right, I got married. Um, my, my husband has since died, but my husband was Stephen. We met at university and we had three children together. And he died at a very young age. Yes, sadly he was 34, so that was a real shame. This is why people call you Fighting Ann, <laughs> yes? Uh, well, I've, I was brought up by my father to believe you either sink or swim in life. And if yes. you're going to swim, swim hard. So, yes. Unfortunately, it was the deadly cancer. That's right. Yes. Skin cancer. Mm. And, uh, you know, ever since then, I've, I've, I've been quite, um, you know, quite positive about people learning to look after their sun in, skin in the sun. And I don't think we do too much, really. We, 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 we don't take as much care mm. as we should. How old your children were at that time? Um, well, my, I had three children, and my youngest was five, and uh, the other two were uh, nine and eleven. You are involved with the All Party uh, Committee for Bangladesh, APPG. That's right. I've, the I'm parliamentary group. I'm chair of the APPG for Bangladesh, and I'm joint chair with Rashnara Ali for the APPG for the rights of the Rohingya. Which Rohingya. We'll we come set to up. That. Yes, 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 we set that up as and well. And you have been the founding chair isn't it, of APPG? No, I wasn't the founding chair. It had been going on for quite some time. But when I came in to Parliament in 2005, mm -hmm. I realised the group wasn't as active as I would like it to be. So after learning about it a bit, I um, took over the chairmanship and I've been running it ever since for about, oh, cracking now, that's 12 years. 12 years yes. now. And since then, you have visited Bangladesh many times. I have, um, and I took a cross-party group after the Rana Plaza collapse. I mm. went with a group of, because of course the APPG is cross-party, and I've also gone many times as with the Conservative Friends of the Bangladesh. Bangladesh. We'll come to that in a minute. Tell us about the activities of APPG. The APPG is cross-party, and it is also it doesn't take any sides politically on whichever government is in, in, in charge in Bangladesh. Our role is to be a critical friend, but also to point where our government can help Bangladesh, direct uh, resources, hopefully, towards them, draw attention, like we, after the Rana Plaza, where there was a, additional uh, resources were needed in training and building resilience. And it, it is really to ensure that we, we ask critical questions over whether it's rights of campaigning, but, uh, but also speak up uh, where we think the government is doing a good job and see if we can bring any concerns to our government's attention. Mm -hmm. You have been an MP for St Albans since when? 2005. So how many times is it now? My four, I've had four elections. Four elections. Yes. You are the founding chair of Conservative Friends of Bangladesh. I set up the Conservative Friends yeah. of Bangladesh, that's right. I'm now its president. I've moved over from the chairmanship role. I'm its president. Mm -hmm. And I set it up in uh, 2006. 
We go on social action projects and we now have branches across the country. I think we're up to over 300 and something odd active members. members yes, um, yes. And, and the whole point of the Conservative Friends of Bangladesh is to do social action projects and to obviously encourage, hopefully, um, members of the Bangladeshi, British Bangladeshi community to get involved with and be perhaps even members of parliament or councillors um, within the Conservative Party. Mm -hmm. So when you lead a group to Bangladesh, mm -hmm. And I think especially mainly Silet. We've been yes. Silet, Dakar and Cox's, Cox's Bazaar. Cox's Bazaar. And um, so what do you do? So you said um, social projects. We do. What we, sort of projects? We, we usually tr we travel very cheaply. We, we don't, no frills at all. We travel very cheaply and we stay, um, I, you know, in just modest hotels or hotels that have been part sponsored. We go over there and we wear T-shirts and working clothes and we go, we've worked with BRAC and sight savers and lepra to look with leprosy. We've looked at um, women, uh, we've worked with slum children, uh, with Tesco's and so on to help. And we take over usually various different things like stationery or we've taken over cricketing equipment and sporting equipment. We've helped, we've helped refurbish a school and uh, we, you know, we, we've, we get our hands dirty. <laughs> you do. We do. You do. Because Absolutely I follow do. you. Yeah. So you are chair of and president of, yes, head yes. of two groups, APPG and, and Conservative Friends of That's Bangladesh. Right. Are there any conflict of, um, you know, the role? No, there's not. No. Absolutely, there's not. And, and actually, um, when the Conservative Friends of Bangladesh went over last September, we went to Cox's Bazaar. Um, we, uh, we went to the Huttapalong camp and the Batugali camp and we uh, came back and those members of parliament that had gone, there was Paul Scully there and, and Bob Blackman and it, those, those members that had gone came back and made representations within the APPG and to the minister who was at the time Priti Patel to get more funding over there. Mm -hmm. So we bring back our work from our social action and use it to inform our parliamentary work. You have been a very strong voice about the Rohingya issue. Yes. And um, you visited last time, I remember. We did. Uh, on the media uh, scene because you went to... Two I weeks think, after they pushed them over in the August. We mm -hmm. were over in September. Tell us about it, your experience. It was horrific. I know things have improved since on the actual camps, but it was horrific. There was a lot of mud. The roads, oh, the tracks within the camp were very, very perilous. When we were there, we saw um, a member of the Rohingya community who had died when the rains had come overnight. Uh, two, uh, 200 people had lost their shelters. Some people were sitting there with just a bag over their head. We were hearing terrible tales. Luckily, we had people with us who spoke the Saleti dialect, and that seemed to be something that they could understand. Where Communicate. The, yes, they could. And we talked to one woman who was there with her grandchildren, and she said her, her husband had been killed, her son-in-law had been killed, uh, her grandson, her baby grandson, had been threatened with genital mutilation. There was horrific stories they were telling us. And while we were there, uh, talking to Médecins Sans Frontières, in was brought an elderly gentleman who had been beaten brutally and his son was in brought in Myanmar. Yes, in Myanmar. And his son was brought in after him wrapped in a carpet sort of thing and he was dead and he, they'd been attacked with machetes. We went to the border and we talked to some of the military that were on the border, on the Bangladesh military, who were more than happy to let us see footage or taken by drones of uh, bombs that have been laid on the mines that have been laid on the border. This is a war crime, of course. And uh, the incidents, they said, the horrific incidents of, of people who'd been attacked and machine gunned as they were fleeing to drive them across the border. And when we went back the second day, the, the sort of no man's land that's over there, the flooding was immense. So people were stranded on a mud bank in the middle of this and it's it's just brutal horrific it's horrific it's brutal and they should be held to account this is the yes. burmese government should be held to account there is never any excuse for what they're doing and i pay tribute to the local community who have had with with great you know composure had to put up with a lot of people coming into their area and it is very difficult for them and i know that's not an easy thing to ask mm. but they have been reached out to their, their muslim brothers and sisters and the tales are horrific there aren't many people left in myanmar no they've pushed most of them over Ruin there's not many left we'll continue our, our um, 
conversation after the break. Viewers, we'll be back soon. Stay with us. Welcome back. We were discussing about the Rohingya issue in Bangladesh. So, Anne, uh, you were saying about some horrific stories yes. about the Rohingyas. So, do you think, of course, the government of Bangladesh and the army and the people have been doing their best they have. to support them? International community, do you think they're doing enough? Some are. I think our country has been brilliant. Uh, they have stepped forward and uh, come, when we came back and another six million uh, was pledged immediately. I think some other countries have talked quite a bit but they haven't actually done anything. I would actually like to see a recommendation um, based on the UNHCR report that this is genocide, that the countries internationally come together and recognize that this is a genocide crime. Um, I also don't think at the moment there is enough ability to push Burma to be able to get in, uh, uh, in Myanmar to get in, to see where the Rohingya would go back to. And Bangladesh can't be, can't be expected to host all this group of people all forever. These people, yeah. They cannot be expected Million. to host them forever. It's, it's not, and what's more, they want to go back yeah. when it's safe. Yeah. When, it's safe. when is it going to be safe? Because, well, you know, they signed agreements with our government you know, that they would take them back. And then only the other, other day they were going to take 250 people. But they do not want to go because they know the consequences when they get there. Well, as you know, some of the camps in Cox's Bazaar have been established a very long time. This isn't yes. a new problem. And part of the major problem, my understanding is, is they have no recognition of citizenship right. within, within Myanmar, in the Rakhine province. And so, they are, have no ability to be part of any political process. They cannot have any representation in Parliament, and they are not recognised. So they are nobodies, according to, to the yeah. uh, Myanmar government. And, and the horrific thing is, is an, um, a lot of the population within Myanmar seem complicit yeah. in this behaviour. And so how can anyone go back? How can you go back? If, and, and unfortunately, many of the women were raped, yes, and yes. some are pregnant as a yeah. result of that brutality yeah. and so how can they go back? Thousands newly born babies. Apparently so. Yeah, but um, the government of Bangladesh, can you imagine we are overpopulated? Yes. And it is an emerging country, you know, there are economic problems as well, but you know, the hospitality and the welcome the government and the people have made, I don't think it is, you know, much talked about uh, internationally. Because it, pro it probably in isn't. You're absolutely right. Because we, as I say, we go on social action projects and I have been around the slums in Dhaka. I have seen the poverty that exists within the, you know, the, the Bangladeshi population. And again, Cox's Bazaar, there is a lot of issues there. There's very, very poor people living around the yeah. Cox's Bazaar area. So I can understand why there is this um, tension, potential tension. Can you imagine if a it's, country... Yeah, uh, country so welcomes reasonable. 600 people that becomes an international news well but there are a mi million mi people million. we are talking about and there's you know. been an aspiration i have heard of in the past that cox's bazaar should be turned into a tourism area well if anyone hasn't been and i probably can't get on the camps anyway as far as the eye can see all the vegetation has gone in fact when i was over there an elephant apparently rampaged through one of the encampments all the vegetation is gone. All the, um, the the beauty of the area is, is unfortunately disappearing. disappearing. Disappearing, and local people are seeing what is their beautiful natural mm. resource inevitably disappearing. And it is it is very hard. Yes. So keep up the pressure. I, I think capacity. the pressure's got to be yeah. Yeah. that people stop protecting China and Russia. Stop, Russia and India. Yes. Of yeah. Stop protecting the brutality that has been exercised against yeah. the Rohingya. Let's talk about Rana Plaza. Yes. You played a vital role during post uh, Rana Plaza. Tell us about it. Well, I was horrified that the Rana Plaza collapse happened. 
Um, but actually, afterwards, we found out it was an accident waiting to happen, where unscrupulous uh, people have overextended buildings. Uh, in that case, a generator was way above where it should have been. It was never meant to be a factory. And so there was a huge number of issues about workers that had been suspicious that the factory had seemed dangerous, but were threatened with not being paid if they didn't but go in. But what did you do? I uh, took over this? a group of parliamentarians. We then uh, conducted a load of research. We met with uh, the building resource um, industry over there. We encouraged uh, Alan Duncan, as there was the minister then, to send additional resources over there to help with building control, to help with uh, looking at the way buildings are. Unfortunately, there's some unscrupulous people working within the development industries over there, but also to try and encourage ethical but practices. But anything, anything uh, was done you know, from the British government, you know, financially? Oh, huge amount of money yeah. was sent over there, um, as well as, I say, resources to help inspect the buildings because suddenly mm. Sheikh Hasina announced a program of building inspections in, in light of mm. the collapse and uh, sh there wasn't the resources within the country, there weren't the trained mm. surveyors. Okay. That was all sent right. over to help. You have been a very strong voice on climate change as well yes. within the British Parliament. You have been to Bangladesh and you know the, what is happening in Bangladesh, yes. what is happening around the world. Do you think Bangladesh is getting enough support to prevent or, you know, the world is supporting Bangladesh enough? Well, it's, it's interesting you say that because one of the things we, th we think we're going to go again next year, we hope mm. to, and one of the things we want to go and look at is the impact of plastic on Bangladesh and the fact that as well, I know, I know there's the issues to do with the w water levels and sea levels, but the amount of plastic that is um, unfortunately finding its way into the water courses that unfortunately is potentially being dumped in areas like Bangladesh, so that it, it, we, we are not supporting countries enough. It, these, That's it. We, we are, I mean, I, I've set up the all party group for the prevention of plastic waste. And I did ask the Prime Minister this week about us exporting our plastic because it's very well recycling over here, but it's ending up being dumped in other countries. Other countries. And Bangladesh, I know, is a victim, is a victim of, yeah. of, of other people's dumped rubbish. Yeah. So after, you know, the Paris Accord, people were hopeful. And when Trump came, future is bleak. So do you think rest of the world is going to unite to do something? Uh, the other day I was uh, watching a program in um, one of the old Russian countries, so Soviet Union. Um, China is building hundreds of coal stations, you know, energy stations. And it is polluting the air. So no one is speaking about it. I don't cause any diplomatic incidents, obviously, but China um, often behaves quite badly in its ethical work practices. And indeed, one of the things I've been looking into is uh, the way mining of rare earths is exploited. You know, we all have rare earths in our, our phones and so on. And China, unfortunately, um, it has improved in some ways, but unfortunately, in many ways, it is, it is part of the problem. Yeah. It is not part okay, of the let's solution. Let's move to something else. You are a very well-known fa face, as I said, within the British Bangladeshi community. Um, when did you first get to know the community? How long ago? Well, to be honest, I didn't really know the community terribly well until I was um, selected for St Albans. And a dear old colleague now who's since died, Gordon Myland, uh, our seat has lost in 97 and 2001. We didn't win it back. And I just said, who are we not talking to? And then I was made aware that there was a very large Bangladeshi community in St. Albans. In your constituency? Yeah, just about four, five thousand, four and a half thousand. Um, and I realized that this was a community I needed to get to know. And I know, okay. know Labour would probably differ, but I would say hardworking, entrepreneurial, family orientated, small business owning, that sounds like a conservative yes, to me. Yes. <laughs> so I thought, hey, I need All to right. talk to these people. Now, about Brexit. The British Bangladeshi community were very hopeful that we would be able to get stuff from the Indian subcontinent and also the Commonwealth would be revived. What is your opinion about that? Well, I'm a Brexiteer, very much so. And one of the things I've always argued is that we should have a fair immigration policy. And by fair, I am not hung up on numbers. I think there's a, a bit of a misnomer that those of us who want a fair immigration policy, I 
I have a real problem that people, if they're from Italy, can just walk into the country, whereas I'm talking to skilled chefs that are needed in, in the Bangladeshi community. The Italian community have the same problem, I know, but the Chinese community have the same problem. Same problem. And they say, well, why can't we bring anyone unless they're earning £35,000? I mean, this is just ridiculous. ridiculous. It's ridiculous. absolutely ridiculous. And I'm sorry, I disagree with some of the latest noises coming out of um, okay. the government on, the, time. Uh, on so, that. On yeah. I do I do think we should be judging on the need of the skills, That's but right, not yes. on a level of salary. That yeah. doesn't work. It's discriminatory. Definitely. So very briefly, tell us about the country you've been to, Bangladesh. You know, the day first day you went and the last day you went. What difference did you see progress wise? From the first time I went, um, I, I was a bit scared, especially with the way the traffic was. Uh, I was thinking, my goodness, how is this ever going to morph into the country that it is? Now I'm seeing a hugely dynamic country. Mm. In a short space of time, it has grown One enormously. One of the 11 emerging it countries It is stunning. The what, it's, and I'm, still, the GDP I, and I'm still scared of the traffic, by the way, over there. But I can see... Things will be sorted. I can see a big drive. And yes. you know what? The role of women. Uh, the Prime Minister has brought in a lot of women into her cabinet. I think the prominence of women within the Bangladeshi political system. I am, I'm really hopeful. I'm really hopeful that your country is just going to take off and fly. Take it off. is because in a short space of time, it's done so much. And in the 12 years that I've been going over there, I've, I've seen massive changes. Finally, about the community here, what difference have you seen, you know, since the beginning and to date? Well, I... I'd like to think that I'm seeing, given the number of, of uh, the all part, uh, sorry, my work with Conservative Friends of Bangladesh, we've got several hundred members now who are active, standing as councillors, getting politically involved. They have a voice within the Conservative Party through myself, other MPs like Will Quince and Bob Blackman. We, we, we want the Bangladeshi community to think that it's not they don't just vote Labour. If they're aspirational on business owning, they have a voice in the Conservative Party. Yes. And I'm seeing hundreds, literally yeah. hundreds, and who are coming towards our party who want to get involved. And that's a good thing. Yeah, thank you. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. I want to thank you for coming to Channel S. You have many appointments even today. And yeah. it is a pleasure, always a pleasure, having you on. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank Lovely. You. Uh, viewers, we'll be back soon with another um, very important guest. Stay tuned with Channel S. Thank you.